What sort of um, energy and money and international cooperation is going into this project, Arnie? Well, right now there's none. Um, really? The, 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 right. The Japanese government and, and Tokyo Electric are controlling everything. You know, it might mean that there are international companies involved, but they're being paid for by Tokyo Electric and the Japanese government. But there's no um, international effort. You know, that the, the European experts or the American experts are not, um, uh, are, are not unilaterally giving up of their time uh, to uh, offer solutions or to expedite the process. Uh, it's just being handled like a construction project, and, and that's, uh, you know, unfortunate to say the least. Well, but, but my understanding is that international governments and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission in the U.S., and I'm sure the Europeans know that if Building 4 goes and collapses, that it could mean quite severe contamination of the Northern Hemisphere. Why isn't there a sense of urgency about this, Arnie Gunderson? Well, I think it shines the light on the fuel pool problem in general, especially in, in the U.S. And um, none of the U.S. utilities want to admit that their reactor fuel pools are uh, as full of, of nuclear material, and in many cases much more full of nuclear material than Fukushima. So the, the, the constituencies here in the states um, don't want to draw attention to the nuclear fuel problem at, at, at Fukushima because, you know, that you, you point one finger at someone and you've got four, three pointing right back at you, and they just don't want to bring attention to the fact that American fuel pools are, are not a whole heck of a lot better. A Japanese research group says it's succeeded in developing a building material that can filter most radioactive cesium from contaminated water. The research group at Kinki University's Faculty of Engineering in Hiroshima Prefecture applied a method using plaster found in traditional Japanese architecture. Called shikui, the traditional material usually mixes lime with sand, but the group used zeolite powder instead of sand as it can absorb radioactive substances. The group says the material is permeable and it could be used to safely store debris and soil contaminated by radiation by preventing radioactive substances from seeping out. At this time, we have data, most of which indicate that the material can absorb over 99% of the cesium. Taga says the result was better than expected. He hopes they can construct a storage center for debris or soil contaminated by the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear accident. How to clean up debris generated by last year's disaster has been a major headache for the Noda administration. But that's not only in Japan. Millions of tons of debris are drifting across the Pacific Ocean, nearing the coast of North America. Government officials are discussing how to tackle the wreckage. The Environment Ministry officials estimate about 1.5 million tons of debris drifted out to sea following the tsunami that hit northeastern Japan. The rubble includes small fishing boats and waste from destroyed houses. Officials are worried the floating ships will pose a threat to navigation. They plan to identify the owners of the vessels by the names of the hull or registration numbers. They will then judge whether to dispose of or accept them by confirming the owner's intention. International law does not require Japan to recover drifting debris. However, the government intends to study possible payment for disposal of the debris. Large amounts of debris, including wreckage from houses, may reach the North American continent from around October. Japanese have been at the mercy of natural disasters throughout their history, earthquakes, tsunami and floods. Many believe they have to be better prepared if they are going to save lives. Participants at a recent international conference in Nagasaki Prefecture exchanged some ideas. 600 people from 31 countries took part. One idea that drew a lot of attention was the use of geoparks. So Nana, what is a geopark? Yes, it's a natural park that has one or more sites of geological importance. An example is a crack in the Earth's crust, or a fault line. It's associated with quakes. 
and it reveals something about how the Earth is composed. Mount Unzen, an active volcano in Nagasaki Prefecture, it erupted in 1991. It spewed out a massive flow of lava and hot volcanic ash that killed 43 people. We spoke to a man who survived that disaster. He's going to great lengths to stress a crucial message. Lessons from that disaster can help everyone be better prepared once in the future. You can see the lava reached here. Shigeo Hasegawa gives tours of the disaster area. The volunteer guide showed conference participants the damage caused when Mount Unzen erupted. He lost three friends who lived in this neighborhood. I didn't want to think my friends died for nothing. Someone has to pass on what they've learned from experiencing a natural disaster to prevent others from suffering. Ten years ago, he set up a group of volunteer guides. They show young people and tourists how destructive a volcano's eruption can be. Hasegawa thought the conference was a great way to pass along this information. The 1991 lava burned down the elementary school. Participants asked lots of questions. I wonder if some locals wanted to get rid of the ruins. There were no objections to it at all. We all agreed that at least one memento had to be preserved. I'm very glad it's, that it hasn't been uh, demolished and then rebuilt. It, it's important that it's, it's left. Now people could visit this place, understand uh, how was the intensity of the, um, the eruption. Human beings cannot completely overcome natural disasters. Unless we continue to pass on our experiences, we'll always be at the mercy of disasters. That's why I ask you to join us in conveying disaster experiences to others. Are there other people in Japan like Hasega using geoparks to help prepare people for natural disasters? Yes, there are. For example, people in the areas devastated by last year's earthquake plan to set up geoparks. They want to conserve destroyed buildings and coastal landscapes ravaged by the tsunami. They hope this will help teach people the dangers of natural disasters. I was left with the impression that the geoparks were having the desired effect. The fact that the gathering took place at an area struck by a disaster may have contributed to that. Chinese tourists visited Fukushima Prefecture on Sunday. It's the first time that such a group has visited the area since last year's March disaster. A Shanghai-based Chinese travel company, which deploys a Chinese low-cost airline, planned the tour to support Fukushima Prefecture. About 40 people consisting of travel agency staffs, media and their families landed at Ibaraki Airport north of Tokyo. They headed for Iwaki City in Fukushima Prefecture by bus. Locals welcomed the group with a ceremony at a spa resort. The group enjoyed a hula dance performance, which is very popular in the city. Local officials explained to the visitors the radiation levels in Fukushima Prefecture during the bus ride. The Chinese group leader said he confirmed the safety of Fukushima and said he believes more Chinese will visit the region in the future. The tour group will stay in Fukushima until Tuesday, visiting a scenic lakeside area.
Millions of people from the U.S. to China made sure they were in the right place at the right time over the past hour. They used telescopes, protective glasses or pinhole cameras to watch a rare celestial phenomenon, an annular solar eclipse. These are images of the eclipse played back at 260 speed. It began in much of Japan around 7.30 a.m. It lasted from a few seconds to a few minutes depending on where viewers were. An annular solar eclipse occurs when the Sun, Moon and Earth are in perfect alignment. The Moon appears smaller than the Sun. So a bright ring, or annulus, forms around the Moon. People living in these parts of the planet were able to see the eclipse. And for the first time in history, the majority of residents in Japan had the opportunity to watch this phenomenon. Clouds obscured the view in some areas, so some people had to struggle to see the ring. Even penguins got caught up in the excitement. Take a look. Cape penguins in Chiba Zoo near Tokyo began squeaking excitedly when the sky darkened during the eclipse. The squeaking lasted for about five minutes. The zookeeper said this type of behavior is rare. A zoologist says penguins often make calling noises at twilight to confirm the location of other penguins. He says they were probably confused by the sudden darkness.